You're listening to Dakota Spotlight. My name is James Walner. This is episode four of the Mandan Murders. If you've not listened to episodes one, two, and three, you'll want to start there. A mass murderer remains on the run tonight after four people were found dead inside a property management company. The police say they don't think the public is in danger. By Wednesday, two days after the murders, Special Agent Joe Ahrens of BCI and Mandan's Lieutenant Pat Haug and their teams had been making some progress. But things were also feeling a little bit stale. Here is Special Agent Joe Ahrens again. You know, we go a couple more days where we don't have a suspect at all. What we're doing is is we have agents interviewing family members and every staff member at RJR, trying to get any leads at all. And we're, we're not getting anything at all. In a way, they knew so much, and at the same time, so very, very little. They had absolutely no idea who this masked suspect was, and yet knew exactly where he went. That is, until the trail ended 50 miles northwest of Mandan in center North Dakota, where they got a good look at the vehicle on a security camera. It was a white Ford F-150 pickup, and believed to be a 2004 to 2008 model, a two-door extended cab, It had rust markings near the rear wheel on the driver's side. Who was driving the Ford F-150? The mysterious man in orange had left the RJR building two minutes after Robert Bockler arrived. Then he took Bill Cobb's pickup and parked it down the street at Indigo Signs. Investigators had followed along and literally watched on video as the unidentified killer walked along the strip, past Bill Barth Ford, then behind Big O Tires, then back to the strip and across a frontage road to McDonald's. There he got in his pickup and drove away. They tracked it down Main Street in Mandan, then past Flying J Truck Stop and finally cruising in center North Dakota. They knew so much, and yet so very, very little. They prepared a second bolo, be on the lookout for, with this newer, better image. They didn't plan on sharing it with the public just yet, because they knew as soon as they did, the phones at every agency within a 500-mile radius would start ringing non-stop. Tips would pour in about every white pickup in the state. And what Joe Ahrens and Pat Haug did not need at that moment was for their teams to drown in a sea of random leads shot from the hip. Yes, things were frustrating. Everyone was on edge. And yes, they might have to ask the public for help at some point. But now, two days in, it was still relatively early. And so first, they put their faith in their colleagues around the state. Be on the lookout for this white pickup. Certainly somewhere, they thought, one of our colleagues at Highway Patrol or a Sheriff's Department or a city cop, somewhere, someone will take a look at that photo and say something like, hey, I know that vehicle. I gave him a speeding ticket the other day. Meanwhile, while waiting for someone to hopefully find that pickup, Aarons and Haug and others did have some other things to look into. One early suspect was an RJR employee who happened to have a white Ford F-150 pickup registered in his name. Also, this guy had behaved in a way that certainly seemed a bit suspicious. When he arrived at RJR that Monday morning and saw all the commotion, the police cars, ambulances, and colleagues in the parking lot, for some reason he just left before police had a chance to talk to him. As you can imagine, the cops tracked him down very quickly. He was detained and questioned. Another thing they looked into were the text messages and phone calls on all four victims' cell phones. When they looked at Robert Fockler's phone, they learned something that would turn out to be a crushing blow to Jackie Fockler, Robert's wife. Just when she thought it couldn't get any worse, it did. She'd lost her husband and three friends, 
And then investigators had to inform her that Robert was having some kind of affair with another woman. They found this other woman, questioned her, interrogated her. There just didn't seem to be anything there. Just another frustrating dead end. About 23 miles northeast of Center, North Dakota, nestled up against the Missouri River is a small town named Washburn in McLean County. With its 1,300 residents, Washburn is the county seat, with a courthouse, sheriff's department, and other county government offices. In Washburn, you've got your schools and park and baseball diamond. You've got your fairly typical downtown Main Street with a few businesses, cafe, museum, a bar or two, public library, a pharmacy. Also on Main Street was a chiropractic office, Isaac Chiropractic, where Dr. Chad Isaac treated his patients. In 2019, three of those patients were Justin Cromer and his parents, Wade and Susan Cromer. Justin Cromer was a 36-year-old detective at the Sheriff's Department. His father, Wade, was on the force too, a captain. For Justin and his parents, the week started out pretty normal. They all woke up on Monday, took a look at their slate, and noted the things they could see coming. Justin and Wade saw work, and when Justin's mother, Susan, looked at her slate, among other things, she noted a four o'clock appointment at the chiropractor on Thursday. By late Monday morning, the Cromers and everyone else in Washburn, and for that matter, the state of North Dakota, had started hearing about the shocking discovery of four bodies at a property management business down in Mandan. Then on Tuesday, Mandan PD blasted that initial bolo be on the lookout for with some low-grade images of a white Ford F-150 extended cab pickup truck. Justin Cromer gave it some thought. Could he think of anyone who drives that kind of vehicle? Only one came to mind, really, but that was his chiropractor, Chad Isaac. He'd seen Isaac driving his white Ford F-150 maybe a hundred times. Isaac often cruised past the sheriff's office when driving between work and home. Still, Justin thought to himself, in the name of due diligence, maybe sometime today I'll drive by my chiropractor's business on Main Street or his trailer home just across the highway. Maybe I'll take a closer look at that pickup. I traveled to Washburn one day to meet Justin Cromer. He was kind enough to give me a driving tour of the area. Today he works as a special agent within drug enforcement for the three affiliated tribes, or MHA Nation, at Fort Bertrand. Over his career, Justin has worked a lot of different kinds of cases. Narcotic cases, the GSI cases. Uh, Aaron Maddies and I have been good detective partners when I was a detective with him. We had a lot of convictions on sexual assaults, um, yeah, narcotics. I mean, once in a little town like this, you kind of get to know sure. where everybody lives and what they do for work and what they drive and all of that. So I didn't know exactly where Chad lives. He was known as a chiropractor in town. I I mean, I guess I'd never heard of any big complaints about his business. Um, I know he stayed he stayed pretty busy. You know, he, he, he stayed to himself. I don't think he was really well known in town, but everyone knew that he was a chiropractor. That's about it. Justin never did find Chad Isaac's vehicle on that Tuesday, April 2nd. And really, nothing in those first photos really jumped out at him either. It was just the fact that it was the same color, make, and model. And there'd be a lot of those pickups in the world. But then, the next day, Wednesday, April 3rd, when Mandan PD put out a second bolo with the photo from center, Justin spied a rust mark on that photo, near the back wheel on the driver's side. And he couldn't help thinking that maybe he'd seen a similar rust mark on Dr. Isaac's pickup. So, even though chiropractor didn't exactly jump off the page as a potential serial killer, Justin called the local BCI agent in Washburn. Special Agent Joe Ahrens. We have an agent stationed up in Washburn who had been in, obviously, in Mandan helping us with this whole thing. And Justin Cromer from the Sheriff's Department up there in 
Washburn contacts our agent from Washburn and just says, Hey, I, and this is, I believe on April 3rd, um, says, Hey, I, you know, this pickup really looks like my chiropractor up here in Washburn. So, you know, we took that information, but it, it wasn't making a lot of sense. Why would a chiropractor from Washburn drive down to man and kill four people and then drive back? But, you know, it's something we'll have to look into, but we were working on some other leads at this point, you know, trying to figure a few other things out. And so nobody was too excited yet, but Justin wasn't about to just drop it. That night, McLean County, Justin Cromer and some of the deputies were going to try to see if they couldn't find this chiropractor, Chad Isaac's pickup, and maybe get some photos of it. They ended up involved in another incident up there that tied them up basically all night long. That's right. As we know, sometimes happens. Something completely out of his control happened and sideswiped Justin's plans that day. Pretty much all of McLean County's law enforcement officers ended up involved in a freakish pursuit of a semi out in a field. It took them late into the night and early morning. Justin Cromer didn't even get a chance to drive by Chad Isaac's home until the wee hours of the morning. Kind of at the end of a, a long pursuit involving a semi and this is Kurt Olson. He is a patrol sergeant in McLean County. Detective Cromer at that time brought it up to me that the slick bulletin that came out looked like his chiropractor's pickup. and Just couldn't, couldn't get past that thought. And he you know, said when he got back to Washburn, he was going to go check it out. And this time, the pickup was parked there, outside of Chad Isaac's trailer home. But at this hour, with no backup and no sleep, Justin didn't feel fully comfortable with the situation. So he called it a night and planned to head back there in the morning. When I met with him, Justin drove me to the spot where Chad Isaac lived, Northwest Estates, lot number 14. The trailer home is long gone. Yeah, so off to your right here. Um, oh, they moved the trailer. Oh, no. Yeah, they did. Is that it? No, they're back here. They must have sold it. So it used to sit right here. Oh, it's gone? Yep, it's gone now. So it was right Right here. where all these weeds are. Okay, so yep. it's gone. And there was like a garage out here, or is that that? That's this thing here, yep. You had a little shed and then a bigger shed. On the garage? Yeah. So the next day I did, uh, Detective Maddie's and I did come, took pictures of it here. Um, it was parked right there in front of his house. Yeah, so did you try to sneak in or? So yeah, I had, I had Detective Maddie's drop me off down this way, um, and then I walked this way. Chad obviously knew me as local law enforcement, sure. but uh, you know, talking to him when I was at his chiropractor business, he always said he wasn't a morning person, so I did it right away in the morning thinking he wasn't going to be up, but about right here as I was walking, his kitchen window was about where that evergreen was, there he is. Oh, okay. Um, and he was staring out the window at me. Chad Isaac standing there, staring out the window at Justin. He's just watching you. Just watching. So I nonchalantly, at that time I was playing clothes. Um, I just nonchalantly walked up to the neighbor's door there and acted like I was doing something else. Then walked back to Detective Maddie's and I'd snapped a couple pictures as I was walking away, and then we, we got out of here. The detectives returned to the station to compare the photos they'd just taken with the shots in the bolo. I called in a couple co-workers to include my dad. Um, put the bolo pictures as well as the pictures I had taken side by side on computer screens. Justin and his father Wade and their colleague Aaron Mattis looked at the bolo photo, that pickup traveling through center North Dakota on Monday morning, just a 25-minute drive from Washburn. Then they looked at the photos that Justin had just taken of Chad Isaac's Ford F-150 pickup. Someone said something like, You gotta be f***ing kidding me. The rust spot matched, some random mud on the bumper matched. I was very confident at that point because the, the rust marks on the rear wheel fender matched up. Mud on the front bumper, I actually didn't notice that when I took those pictures, but that was um, a match. 
All of a sudden, Justin's most recent encounter with Chad Isaac, while he was doing reconnaissance outside of his home that very morning, that all felt a little eerie. Yeah, and then him sitting there staring in that window was also awkward. Everything became real then. One of them said, we gotta send this to BCI. Then Justin looked at his father Wade and one of them said something like, maybe we tell mom not to go to her appointment at the chiropractor today. Joe Aarons again. And he sends me the photos and I looked at it and I, I was comparing them to the photos that we had. I was in shock. I was sure that was that pickup. I reached out to the agents that were doing all these interviews of staff and it told them, finish up the one you're on and start heading to Washburn. And we had some agents available that I sent straight up to Washburn right then and there. Kurt Olson again. I got a call asking me to come to Washburn for briefing. Justin Cromer. Based on the fact that my mom had a chiropractor's appointment with him that day, so I knew that he was going to work that afternoon. The sheriff briefed us and we'd, we'd put in an all call and uh, kind of made a plan on how we were going to do this. We eventually all end up in Washburn, basically conducting surveillance in Chad Isaac's house. Um, There's a lot of strategy that went into who was going to be where and, and uh, we should make the detainment at his house or a traffic stop. Who was going to participate in the traffic stop? Um, we also have a helicopter up at this point watching his house. Um, he's coming out of his house periodically decided that if he should try to flee that we'd use our uh, MRAP and another vehicle to stop him from fleeing the scene. About four o'clock he's observed getting into his pickup drives away from the residence. I was kind of across the road across highway 83 just sitting in a parking lot waiting. Or McLean County pulls him over. Deputy Nielsen, Sheriff Kurzman, Detective Comer. Chad's taken into custody and I took him directly over to my patrol vehicle. Put in this squad car, I get there, I speak with him for a minute. All he asks me about is his dog. He, he didn't even ask me what this was about. Hi, I'm reporter Trisha Tarinskis. If you want more true crime stories from the upper Midwest, be sure to check out The Vault, where you'll find a podcast hosted by me, You'll also find a treasure trove of archival photos, video, and interviews to help bring the mayhem and mysteries to life. Find The Vault at inforum.com slash The Vault. All he asks me about is his dog. Said he wanted the dog to go to the neighbors, so I pass that information on. Um, we tow his pickup to McLean County. We take Chad to the Sheriff's Department in McLean County. I'm going to try to interview him at that point. Kurt Olson again. You know, the transport to the office, it, it was just a totally a, a dead silence on that ride. Nobody said anything. Just seemed like kind of eerily silent. During all of this, we actually have Amanda and Detective writing search warrants for Chad Isaac's residence, Chad Isaac's pickup, his clinic, and his person. Took him into the room and I changed his handcuffs out to be in the front and introduced myself just, you know, as kind of an icebreaker so he knew who I was. Just some water for you. Oh, yeah. Just yeah, water right. for you. Yes, sir. I'm Sergeant Olson. And uh, reached out to shake his hand and said something to the effect, of, I don't shake hands. I'm, you know what? I'm not a handshaker. No, no. Please don't take that personally. Oh, it's an old injury okay. and I no. just I don't shake not hands anymore. Okay. I was somewhat taken aback by that. With their suspect in custody, Special Agent Joe Aaron set out to interview him. A couple of helpful notes here. You may recall that when the mysterious man in orange was seen on the RJR parking lot video, he was seen carrying some kind of wire. Inside RJR, investigators found a wire saw. A wire saw is pretty much what it sounds like. It's a sharp wire attached to two handles, and it's used for sawing through tree branches or places that are hard to get to with a regular saw. You basically drape the wire around whatever it is you want to cut, hold each handle with your hands, and then sort of seesaw back and forth to force the wire through the branch, or whatever it is you're attempting to cut. 
Also to note here, investigators also found a shoe impression at RJR, a shoe impression in blood, and it had an unusual tread pattern. Get in the room with Chad, and one of the things I notice is he's wearing a dark maroon sweatshirt, or just a sweatshirt and dark jeans, and he has paint on him. He's got dried paint on his hands. He's got dried paint on his pants. Which I found odd for if you're going to work as a chiropractor that you're going and you have paint all over your, dried paint all over your hands and dried paint all over your clothes. How's it going besides this, obviously? But I guess you guys are going to tell me why I'm here. Sure are. Um, well, like I said, my name is Joe Aarons. I'm a special agent with the North Dakota Bureau of Criminal Investigation. And this is Dan Heidbrenner, also a special agent. With I think I've heard that name before somewhere. Really? Maybe. Sounds like a politician's name. But one of the things I noticed right away when I got into the room with Chad, he had orange fibers, like fuzz, on his sweatshirt. When I say orange, this is like blaze orange, hunting orange that people wear out here. So it's a very bright orange that really stands out. Eventually, Chad says he doesn't want, he, he would prefer to have a lawyer with him, denies any knowledge of this crime having occurred. What, what am I being charged with? Let's start with that. Well, you're not being charged with anything right now. We just... Okay, well, what, 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 what your, is... Your name what? came up in something, and we just wanted to talk to you about it. Okay, can you tell me... Is this drugs, or what are we talking about here? No, um, it, it has nothing to do with drugs at all. It has to do with what's been on the news in Mandan. Okay, I honestly, I don't have cable TV at my house, okay. unless something's on the radio. Uh -huh. it, would, it would have been all over the radio. I, I, I haven't heard anything on the radio in Mandan. I actually listened to a radio station, mm -hmm. not a Mandan, KNDR, a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Other than that, the last few days, the only television stations that have been coming in at my house are the per public stations. So okay. Sure. Right. Okay. So I, I haven't heard anything on the news. Like, so. Okay. Right. We have his shoes that he was wearing at that time, and I notice on his shoes there's also orange fibers on his shoes. So I collect those orange fibers and we also collect the shoes, which later on we find to be a match to that unusual shoe impression in RJR. While that's going on, we have agents that are processing Chad's pickup through a search warrant we had gotten and they find some orange fibers in there also. One of the other things that they find is blood on different parts of the vehicle, um, door latches and seat belts, if I remember right. They collect those. They do some testing just to make sure it's blood and it's, it's testing p positive for blood. We can't test at the seed for DNA or anything like that, but we can at least say that this reddish substance is blood and not something else. So we collect all of that. At that point, with what we've seen so far, Chad's placed under arrest for the four homicides that occurred at RJR. For a lot of people who were living it and, and kind of had the fear of what was happening in Mandan, and maybe it wasn't quick. This is Gabrielle Goder. In 2019, she was assistant state's attorney in Martin County and prosecuted the case. But from my experience and from law enforcement's experience of starting with no idea who did this, right, to being able to have somebody arrested and charged to, and being confident in those charges mm -hmm. within like a matter of three days. That was huge. Um, and it happened not by fluke, but, you know, because people in the community were paying attention yeah. because we had those videos. Then kind of tracking back to finding him at a, it basically almost being able to follow him to his house. You know, the, how often does that happen? As a Dakota Spotlight listener, you're naturally curious and love to know what's happening in the community around you. Have you considered a subscription to the forum? You'll get unlimited access to in-depth news coverage, weather, sports, and more right at your fingertips. Local news works for you. Visit inforum.com slash subscribe now to sign up and stay informed. After Chad had been arrested and we ended up getting done with the search of the vehicle, we proceeded over to his house, which was just down the road a little ways in in Washburn. And we executed the search warrant on his house, went through the house. One of the things I noticed right away when we stepped foot in this house was a strong odor of bleach. 
in the house. And we noticed some empty bleach bottles laying on the floor in a garbage bag next to the door. So as we start processing his house, you know, we notice more of, more of these wire saws are laying in those wires. There's more of those laying in his house on a, in some totes that he had sitting there. Um, when he went into his bathroom, there was a spray bottle of bleach sitting on the bath, on the shower floor. Really, really strong odor of bleach in that bathroom. He had a wristwatch laying in the sink that had appeared to have been bleached. So what one of the things we later on did was we sprayed a substance called Blue Star. It helps. What it does is if blood that isn't visible to the naked eye, you can spray it and have the lights out and that blood will glow blue color. The other thing that'll glow even a brighter blue and it flickers is bleach. Well, we sprayed the shower area with this blue star to see if any blue, and the whole bathroom glowed a blue color. So you could tell that bleach had been sprayed around that bathroom. In Chad's bedroom in one of the dresser drawers was an empty box for 357 revolver. Um, again, we, we were looking for essentially a 38 or a 357 revolver because that's what we believed had been used. One of the odd things was that inside that empty box was a Walmart receipt from the day before we were there. So April 3rd of for 20. The gun itself? No, for, um, for charcoal and lighter fluid. Um, so along the line somewhere that gun had been taken out of the box, but then a receipt for things not related to the gun were put in the box the day before. So quite odd. Um, it, he has an extra bedroom that's used as an office. Inside that extra bedroom in the closet, there was a, a sock draped over like the, the clothes rod. And inside that sock were nine empty shell casings. Um, again, we had nine rounds that had been fired in there. Um, one of our agents checked the dryer. Um, his clothes dryer. And in there we found a mask, an orange and camel reversible mask, um, which made sense because I guess I could go back a little bit. The video that we had gotten, one of the things that we noticed when the suspect left the RJR pickup that the, in the Indigo, par um, Indigo Signs parking lot, the suspect when they fled that vehicle was also not wearing orange anymore and was wearing black or dark colors. Um, and one of the things you could always notice on some of the videos is an unusual bulge around the suspect's stomach, which made us believe from seeing that, that that orange clothing was tucked inside of a black jacket that the suspect was now wearing. Um, but so the reason I say that is because that orange mask was reversible. So the other side, if you turn that mask inside out, it was camouflage, which would have made sense then that the suspect when they left the vehicle was now wearing darker clothing. Um, but in that dryer, we found um, the orange mask. We found black pants. We found an orange hoodie. Uh, we found shoes that had the same um, tread pattern as what we saw at RJR. But to note on that, because I had said that the shoes that we took from him that he was wearing when he was arrested also matched, they were the same shoe. They were the same style of shoe, which later on we find that he had, I believe, 17 more pairs of that same pair of shoes. Um, we found black, a black jacket, black pan. One of our agents, while he was standing in the kitchen, opened up the freezer because we check everywhere, um, starts going through the freezer and finds a plastic container that's labeled like vegetable soup on it. He opens it up and they're the parts to, uh, that 357 revolver, um, which also smelled of bleach at the time. Um, another thing we had noticed when we walked in to the house initially was that there was a chair with four legs tipped upside down and two black gloves were on, were sitting on the legs like they were put there to dry and they appeared to have had bleach on them. Yeah. And, and, and the things that we saw in the video were that the suspect was wearing gloves. Um, suspect was wearing dark pants, orange hoodie, orange mask. Um, later on, one of our agents is able to do some video enhancement and enhance some of those images and get better looks at the shoes, which appear to now match what we have, Chad Isaacs. Um, the mask, when he enhances it, you're able to see that it was a reversible mask. When we processed, 
William Cobb's pickup, going back on that, there was a lot of orange fibers on the center. He had a leather center console that was like a, a compartment that you'd open up the top and you put things in. Well, on top of that leather were, was a lot of orange fibers that we collected. So it appeared that at some point, some, some of this orange clothing had been set on top of that center console area to, at some point and okay. left a lot of fibers there. Investigators also searched Chad Isaac's chiropractic clinic. There they found his calendar on his desk and found some notations referencing RJR. Yeah, he had a note on a calendar that said for, I believe it was for March 30th, something about um, stay RJR, stay is I think what it said. Me. Yeah, yeah, something like that. I don't remember the exact wording. Um, Chad and his house had a lot of sticky notes with like just little sayings on them. Um, one was something about, uh, and I don't remember the exact wording, but this is the time of year where you do stupid things. Um, might not have meant anything by it. We don't know. Um, that blood that was found in Chad Isaac's pickup when they did that search was sent to the state lab along with the DNA of all four of our victims. And they were able to match the DNA of Robert and Lois Cobb. I believe, yeah, it was Robert and Lois. So Robert Fockler and Lois Cobb's DNA was found to essentially be in Chad Isaac's pickup. They also looked into the blood smear found on Bill Cobb's pickup, found over at Indigo Signs. They got a DNA profile to see whose blood it was. That was the victim, one of the victim's bloods. I believe it was Robert and Lois's blood is what ended up being found on in the vehicles. Um, you know, so where... The one of most interest was in Chad Isaac's pickup because Robert and Lois and William all used that pickup that um, William was driving. So there would always be some sort of maybe explanation as to why their blood would have been in that vehicle. But there's absolutely no explanation that anyone could ever explain as to why Robert or Lois's blood would be in Chad Isaac's pickup. These orange fibers that we located in in William's pickup and on Chad Isaac. And uh, we ended up sending the victim's clothing in also to the ATF lab. They did analysis on the fibers and they found that the, there were orange fibers on the victim's clothing also. And those fibers essentially matched the fibers from the orange clothing that Chad Isaac had in his dryer. Again, they can say 100% because these are mass produced items, but they could say that essentially they had all the same chemical and physical characteristics. Um, the shoe impression that was left was also analyzed by the ATF lab. And they again were able to not exclude Chad Isaac's shoe as being the contributor, which essentially it was the same, um, same pattern, same size. And they, they couldn't say that his shoe didn't, but again, the shoes are mass produced. So it'd be hard to say absolutely this shoe is the only one that could have, but they could say that this essentially this type of shoe in this size. So again, one, any one piece of that evidence would not have right. probably been enough, but when you start taking it all, um, one of the unusual things was that with that revolver that was located, um, the barrel and cylinder were missing. And we never did recover them. Those are the two pieces that you would need to do ballistic testing on that gun. Everything else was kept, but that barrel and that cylinder were missing. They could say that these bullets could have been fired from Chad Isaac's gun, assuming it was all intact, but they couldn't say for certain that it was. Still yet to come in future episodes of the Mandan Murders. Did Chad Isaac leave any clues behind about why he committed these crimes? And who were Bill and Lois Cobb? Who was Robert Faulkner? And who was Adam Fuhrer? We'll meet friends, family, and loved ones of all four of them. I really appreciate you listening to Dakota Spotlight. Thank you so much for being here, and I will see you next time. So he called me and said, where are you? And I was in a car on Maine, and I said, I'm at Grandma's house. <laughs> He's like, okay, well, I'm on my way to go make sure you're at Grandma's house. 
look out the window, Adam's here. And then it's like, and then it was, then it was time to pick on his sister. And, and I called my mom and I told her that I gave my daughter her middle name. It was just such a proud moment. I could hear it in her voice. Um, and he would just be making breakfast. Um, and that was, I just remember that was almost every Sunday. You have to choose to live life the way that they would have wanted you to. Go to Spotlight is a production of Forum Communications. To see photographs, documents, video, and more about this season, head over to inforum.com slash mandanmurders. Want to support the show? We are entirely funded by subscribers of Forum Communications Company. To become a subscriber and support the show, go to inforum.com slash subscribe. Find more Dakota Spotlight at inforum.com slash Dakota Spotlight and check out the vault section for more true crime. And don't miss the awesome Dakota Spotlight Facebook group. To join, go to facebook.com slash groups slash Dakota Spotlight. Once again, thank you so much for listening to Dakota Spotlight. I'll see you next time.